Well, good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I'm director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at Northeastern University. And once again, on a, an early uh, Wednesday evening, uh, you've uh, chosen to join us uh, in the open classroom, which uh, this semester uh, has focused on questions and issues around uh, different ways of thinking about community engagement. Uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, a fascinating conversation lined up uh, around the subject of uh, philanthropy. And uh, before we get into it, I want to remind folks that uh, this session is being uh, recorded and will be archived, uh, that if you have questions uh, or comments, uh, you're welcome to post them in the uh, question box. And you're also welcome to add comments in the chat box. But I, I have to say we prefer it if you uh, use the Q&A box because we tend to see that faster. And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Rebecca Riccio, uh, head of our social impact lab at Northeastern University. Rebecca, you're on. Thank you so much, Ted. And hello, everyone. Welcome back to those of you who have been joining us all semester. And welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. Um, we have been looking all semester at um, this notion of empowering communities to have a voice in the decisions that affect their lives. And we've organized those around something that the Social Impact Lab in collaboration with other people on campus in the community um, have developed called the principles of anti-oppressive community engagement for university researchers and faculty. And I am so excited about tonight because on our list, uh, our to-do list of making uh, these principles um, real in the world, embodying them uh, in ways that we can hold ourselves accountable is to also think about a version that would address those the same notion of anti-oppressive engagement between philanthropists and nonprofit organizations. And, and why that's so important is that in 2022, it is far past time for anybody who purports to engage in social change in which we are inserting ourselves into other people's lives and communities with the intention to affect some kind of change or do good or, or, or bring our resources to bear. Um, it is well past time for us to be reflecting on what that means in terms of having the power and privilege to engage in that kind of work and to have control over the resources that needs uh, that are needed to get that work done. And so this notion of reimagining power and resource distribution in the nonprofit sector, I think is becoming uh, increasingly heard as a rallying cry in the space. It's not a new idea, um, but it is one that uh, in the past 10 years or so, I would say also with the publication of Decolonizing Wealth by Edgar Villanueva and many others who I won't be able to do justice in talking about those calls. Um, but I think that they have come, come have been increasing and the last uh, two and a half years or so in particular have drawn attention to how imperative it is for us to reimagine everything about how we do the work of social change. Um, I am seeing this at a late stage in my career, and I'm especially excited to have three young voices who I believe are going to be the way forward in this. Uh, it's not just about talking about how we do it, it's about actually doing it. And Liza Yanni and Aditi embody that work. So tonight we have with us Yanni Burgos, who is the co-director of Resist and co-founder of the Movement Sustainability Commons, which we will learn about in just a minute. Liza Barrett, the Associate Director of the Resource Organizing Project, and Aditi Delakia, who is the Social Justice Philanthropy Fellow in Boston Social Innovation Forum, as well as an MPA student in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern, uh, which uh, just adds another dimension of my delight in having the three of you here tonight. So we're gonna hear from each of them first and then hopefully engage in a great conversation about uh, the inspiration to do this work, the opportunities that we see, but also where the systemic challenges still lie that we're gonna have to address in the coming years. Um, so if it's all right with uh, you, Yanni, we will start with you to lay out what you are doing with RESIST. And thank you so, so much for being here. Yeah, truly my pleasure. Hi, everyone. 
Um, I'm trying to get my screen share going. Here we go. Um, yeah, so again, my name is Yanni Burgos. I use she, they pronouns, and I am the co-director of resource redistribution at Resist and a founding member of Movement Sustainability Commons. Uh, just to ground you a little bit in who Resist is, we've been around since the mid 60s, originally as an anti-war organization uh, founded by a bunch of professors, including Noam Chomsky, pushing back against uh, the various wars that were uh, either uh, actively a part of or being introduced to, and over time evolved into a uh, philanthropic organization. Um, our mission as a foundation is that we support people, people's movements for justice and liberation. We redistribute resources back to frontline communities at the forefront of change while amplifying their stories for building a better world. Um, the, my title as co-director of resource redistribution comes from the fact that we are a worker self-directed nonprofit, um, which merges some of the uh, gifts of the worker cooperative structures with some of the structural opportunities that the 501c3 status gives us. Um, and so we're all, while we might say that we're like a flat structure, we're all responsible for different categories of work, um, but together make some of the big picture strategic decisions within the organization. So already at the like structure of the system, rethinking how power functions within the organization organization so that then we can redistribute power out of the organization. There. And I want to zoom in, given that we're talking about uh, resource redistribution, about my line of work. Um, at Resist, every bit of work that we do has its own unique principles. And so I wanted to share a little bit about uh, the, our funding principles. Um, we have them listed here. The big one that I wanna focus in on is reversing power dynamics. Um, I wanna say about eight or nine years ago, we had an internal conflict that really transformed who Resist was. Uh, once upon a time, the folks who were making the decisions um, were a combination of staff and board members who represented some community-based organizations, but predominantly um, academics and PhD students um, who were studying social movements and the way in which power shifted, but had not been embedded in how movements were functioning in that moment. Um, frankly, because of a number of ways which oppression moves, we had a total implosion of the organization. And the staff at the time used that implosion as a means to really pivot how we as a philanthropic organization functioned. And at the core of that was thinking about and really embodying how we reverse power dynamics. And so all of our grant making decisions are made by current and former resist grantees um, who are paid members they're paid uh, just as much and if not more hourly um, than staff do because their decision making is the core of what we do as an organization um, we see that as an opportunity to really both pivot how our grantees think about how philanthropic organizations function, um, and also to build out our own analysis within our organization around what we're trying to prioritize in any given moment. Because the folks on the ground are the folks who have the clearest pulse on how strategies are shifting in a day-to-day, week-to-week, year-to-year, pandemic-to-pandemic reality. Historically, most of our resource redistribution has focused primarily on financial resources um, up until community invited us to do more. Uh, click on the next slide. I want to share a little bit just about uh, some of our decision making structures and including our grant making panel. Um, so they rotate yearly. We make sure we compensate them. Um, we prioritize their feedback and how our programming moves forward. Uh, this year, I'm excited. We are at the phase where we're getting ready to uh, shift and experiment with structures around how our grant making happens. Um, and in addition, we have a circle of elders which is comprised of elders both in age and experience who help hold conflict both 
within and alongside resist, um, as well as in moments where new strategies for how we as a philanthropic organization can show up. Um, we convene strategic design groups of staff, board members, and resist current and former grantees um, to guide us in all big picture decision making. Now, I previewed uh, that historically we've given money and then we were asked to do more. Um, and just to give a quick note, we are a national funder, but we have very local roots. Our offices are in Boston. All of, most of our staff is based in Boston. Um, and our history comes from being in the Boston sector. And so we've have, had a lot of deep, deep relationships with various movement leadership in Boston who identified that there was a clear infrastructural problem in the social justice sector. Um, there were a number of big nonprofits who had movement roots, who were offering fiscal sponsorship, bookkeeping training, um, attempting to connect folks to um, fundraising and other philanthropic connections um, to create sustainability. Um, but the truth is there wasn't anyone who was taking some clear ownership around building out that infrastructure. And so Resist alongside our partner organization, uh, the Center for Economic Democracy, um, created what we're calling movement sustainability commons. Um, we see our role as uh, really thinking about nourishing and sustaining groups and uh, movements in all of New England, starting in Boston, um, but want to do it in a way that really prioritizes not focusing in on the nonprofit system and the nonprofit structures, but what we're calling creating an off-ramp for the nonprofit industrial complex. Moving away from creating, replicating structures and systems that have been used um, to reduce and hinder power, but to create some freedom and some flexibility for people to do what they do best. How we do that, we partner with people in groups who are leading and supporting movements for justice and liberations. And together we think about what are the ways that we can create pathways for sustainability. We try to do that in phases. Sometimes we start with groups who are already at various phases, which I'm excited that Liza invited us here because a resource organizing project is an example of a group um, who while we were forming, were like, we wanna help you and then pivoted into, oh no, we wanna partner with you and be a part of what you're doing. Um, so we're kind of at the phase two and are now at the phase three of, of our work. So it's been really exciting to learn um, with ROP. Um, but connected to our relationships to community, we start with experimentation, learning with folks um, who have the energy and expertise to build out systems and structures and to play with new ways of being. If and when that feels like a good place to continue building, we'll establish projects or build out pathways and then from there sustain and scale with a focus on being financially healthy and self-sustaining to give you a sense of some of the projects that we're playing with right now. Um, so on the experimental side, we're thinking about how we equip bookkeepers um, to be in a relationship with each other and build capacity. Um, we're thinking with grant writers um, around how we build out that field. Um, projects and pathways that are beyond the experimental space um, include out resist circle of elders model into something that we can offer to communities around conflict resolution. Um, we are building out a retreat center and then the stuff that we're just trying to scale because we know um, that not only the social justice context needs it, um, but we have played with it enough that we're ready to keep building it more things like fiscal sponsorship and most of the work of the resource organizing project. And lastly, this work doesn't happen alone. Um, and in particular with Movement Sustainability Commons, we really run to ground ourselves in the communities that have asked us to build this out. And so wanted to share with you the list of partners that we're currently working with. There's a lot. Um, and 
at this point, we're predominantly in uh, Massachusetts and like the Boston area, but have begun to expand into New Hampshire, Connecticut, Maine, really trying to prioritize Rhode Island, really trying to prioritize and build an infrastructure that decentralizes um, access to resources to city hubs um, and creates an interconnected movement that can work and thrive together. And that's where I'll pause. And I will pass it over to Liza to talk about one part of our work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yanni. It is amazing being part of the Movement Sustainability Commons. And um, it's amazing being here. Um, I, Rebecca and I were just talking about how we met a couple of years ago, um, doing working as safety marshals in direct action marches um, in Boston and have continued to work on that together. So it's really cool to be here in this context um, and to meet um, the rest of you. Um, so grateful for this work happening. Um, so um, I'm Liza, I, uh, I work for the Resource Organizing Project, and I'm here to share a bit of um, sort of how movement fundraisers are operating within these shifts in power um, that Ted, Rebecca, and, um, and uh, Yanni have all been talking about. Um, and when I say movement fundraisers, I mean, when we look at groups on the ground, um, so you know, community organizers, the people within those groups who are responsible for raising the funds to pay the salaries, whether that's volunteers, uh, you know, staff who are primarily organizers or staff who are devoted you know, mostly to fundraising. Um, so I have been doing some form of movement fundraising in Boston for about 10 years now. Um, I got into it through organizing. Um, I started out in the Palestine Solidarity Movement um, and, uh, you know, in those campaigns, you know, very quickly became frustrated by how underfunded our Palestinian led movements were next to, um, you know, right wing uh, movements uh, to support uh, Israeli policies. Um, and it became really clear to me as it does to, to many organizers that our movements need to grow. If we're gonna win, um, we need to be able uh, to, to be on a more equal footing in terms of resources um, that we bring to these fights. Um, so I really strongly believe that our, our movements need money. Um, we gotta win and um, our organizers deserve good pay and benefits. Um, everybody in the movement needs access to training, access to space, to supplies. Um, so to, you know, all of the things that the Movement Sustainability Commons is offering, um, you know, our movements need and it needs money. Um, and we can't be burning out our leaders by um, you know, working without the resources we need. Um, so for movement fundraisers, we face a lot of challenges and barriers to raising the money that we need um, in order to win. So um, you know, to, to state the obvious, we start with, with wealth inequality, um, that in an economy that's built upon uh, genocide and slavery and colonialism, um, wealth is concentrated in the hands of people who don't want our movements for liberation to win. Um, and so um, that means it's it's pretty hard to, to access that money for our movements. Um, I'll also say, you know, Yanni referred to, um, you know, an off ramp for, for, uh, from the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, so just back to that, like charities, the structure of charities in the US, um, it emerged as a, a structure so that people in power can maintain control over our communities and our communities work. Um, so this puts nonprofit fundraisers in a really tight position where we're trying to keep um, our organization's doors open because we're doing vital, urgent work, whether it's for housing justice or police abolition or um, you know, environmental justice. Uh, and so we need that money. And yet sometimes the messages we're getting from funders um, and what they're wanting from us are different from um, what our communities are, are asking for and trying to organize for. Um, so, you know, we're looking for money where it exists, whether it's government grants, foundations, corporate sponsorships, and that money usually comes with strings attached, um, whether it's explicitly saying you can't engage in this kind of political activism, whether it's more of an implicit like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that because it could piss the funder off, or if it's just like, you know, not anything sinister, but like, you know, foundation saying, here's our grant cycle, like we need these applications and these reports and you need to spend the money on these things within this time frame. So it doesn't give our organizations the flexibility that we need in order to be bold and to be able to respond rapidly to political developments and developments in the movement. Um, 
And of course, when we rely on like a, a small number of big grants um, to keep our doors open, it means that just the whim of any one uh, any one funder, um, you know, could could mean we close our doors because we lose a big grant, and that's always really scary. Um, I'll also just say that like the role of the movement fundraiser is exhausting and isolating. Um, we may be like, as, as movement organizations, we might be collaborating with a wide network, network of other organizations when it comes to our campaign and our community building. But when it comes to fundraising, a lot of foundations and funders are, are pitting us against each other to compete for the same um, limited pool of funding. Um, and again, um, if we, you know, if our, our funding is coming from a different group than our community base, sometimes we're like, do we take this money or not? Um, and it can, you know, lead to a lot of internal conflicts in our organizations um, because it really sets us up to not not have an easy way to fund our work. Um, and of course, you know, the level of racism and sexism and classism and philanthropy, uh, you know, means that it's just very hard for people to come out of our bases um, and actually um, do the work of fundraising without burning out. Um, so this is all uh, the context in which ROP resource organizing project exists um, to try to address some of these issues and create supports um, for fundraisers to navigate this system and build more sustainable um, organizations and fundraise in a way that's more aligned with our values of organizing. Um, basically, we believe fundraising doesn't have to contradict our movements. Uh, it can be a form of organizing and power building and healing. Um, and um, our, our organization was founded uh, one year ago um, as part as an offering of the Movement Sustainability Commons, but um, we emerged out of about 10 years of um, collaboration with small justice and liberation organizations throughout New England and a number of pre-existing projects kind of came together to start this. Um, so we work with um, about 60 different New England movement organizations who are all engaged in either base building style organizing um, or in solidarity economy work. Um, I know you all had the session on solidarity economy a couple of weeks ago, so I was like super excited um, about that. Um, and uh, so we, we do this through a few main strategies. Um, one is uh, strengthening sustainable fundraising practices um, among, organize, among um, organizers and fundraisers. Two is building community among fundraisers across organizations. And three is actually doing the fundraising collaboratively. Um, and these are all um, sort of survival strategies for radical nonprofits that we are collaboratively building up. Um, so I'll start with strengthening sustainable fundraising practices. Um, despite you know, what I already said about wealth inequality, um, the majority of philanthropic giving in this country actually comes from working in middle-class people. So you know, statistically, the less money we make, the, more, the, the bigger of a proportion of that money we are going to give um, to charities and to communities. Um, so like, that's a huge opportunity for our organizations to move towards abundance and to say, you know, the people that we're organizing can also be our funders. Um, and that means if we're getting, um, you know, hundreds or thousands of smaller dollar donations from our people, our communities, it means that money is reliable, it's sustainable. And most importantly, like we are then in, in making like decision, strategic decisions in our activism, like we're accountable um, to the people who are, are doing that organizing and are directly impacted. Um, so specifically resource organizing project um, trains organizations in building monthly donor programs, which is kind of one of the more accessible ways um, for folks across class to um, become donors. So uh, we have a sustainer learning circle, which is a, a year long cohort um, that um, four or five organizations will participate in where uh, they learn and share best practices for building monthly donor programs. They develop um, and implement um, those, those programs and really support and like peer, give each other peer support. Um, and then we, um, provide a, um, a stipend and matching funds that ROP raises in order to really make that work sustainable um, for, uh, for fundraisers. Um, our next strategy is building community. Um, so in order to push against the sense of competition that um, I mentioned before, we have um, 
a program called the Grassroots Fundraisers Circle, um, and it's a monthly drop-in space for movement fundraisers throughout New England to find connection and grounding and support. Um, it's peer facilitated, and sometimes it's really focused on skill building. Um, so, you know, this spring our focus is on fighting burnout. So, one month we focused on, um, you know, implementing organizational structures to fight burnout. This month we're going to focus on um, how to uh, build collaborative fundraising within your organization so you're not isolated and burning out. Um, and sometimes it's just like a space to troubleshoot um, and to be like, I'm having this really, a really hard time with this funder. And other people can be like, oh, I also had that problem with this funder. <laughs> like, let's put our heads together um, and sort of say, like, you know, we, we all benefit when any one of our organizations is able to, to access more um, sustainable funding. Um, finally, we fundraise collaboratively um, for ROP that's mainly through collaborative events. Um, so our, our main one is a, a annual um, lobster picnic called the Celebration of Grassroots Organizing. Um, it's happening for the ninth year this year um, on June 25th, um, and it's organized by and funds 11 um, community organizing groups um, on the front lines of Boston movement work. Um, and uh, together we get together and celebrate um, and we raise over $100,000 um, that's split evenly between those groups. And we are, um, you know, each year we're trying to expand by bringing in more groups. Um, so, um, you know, if you, uh, if you like lobster or vegetarian or kosher alternatives to lobster, um, we hope you'll join us on June 25th. And if you're connected to like, a, um, you know, an institution that might be interested in becoming a sponsor, we also welcome that. Um, so I will stop there because I'm out of time, but i um, really excited to talk more about, about these shifts. So thank you, everybody. And Aditi, you'll close us out for this opening session. Awesome. It is um, so humbling to follow um, these two amazing people. I'm really excited to be here in conversation with Liza and Yanni. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aditi Delakia. I am going to uh, share my slides briefly. Um, I love technology. If you could not tell. Um, oh, hold on. Okay, you know what? We're gonna go without slides um, because my laptop is being weird. Um, that's okay. Hi everyone, my name is Aditi. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a master's in public administration student at Northeastern University. Uh, actually going to graduate in less than a month, which is really exciting and I can't stop talking about it. Um, and then I also work as the social justice philanthropy fellow at the Social Innovation Forum here in Boston, um, soon to be the funder education program manager. Um, so, Let's talk a little bit about what we do. So Social Innovation Forum is an intermediary of sorts. I think that's the best way that we can sort of describe the work that we do. Um, and we sort of sit at the intersection of um, nonprofits in the area. We're very place-based in the greater Boston area. Um, at the intersection of nonprofits who are really, you know, looking to uh, further their reach, uh, grow their impact, um, even just, uh, increase their capacity in terms of staff. Um, and then also on the other side, uh, funders who are really interested in funding uh, social change work here in Boston and, and doing it in a way that feels um, like their resources are being allocated in the best possible way, um, or at least in the most useful way. Um, and so we sort of sit in that in-between space as, our inter as an intermediary to build sort of these connections and these bridges between these funders and these nonprofits. Um, and so we like to say that the basis of our work is really in building relationships. Like that's really what we're centered in and we're building community um, is sort of our goal, our vision. Um, because as Liza said, and as Yanni said, like this work does not happen in silos and in fact should not happen in silos. This has to be collective work. This has to be work that happens in community with one another. You know, uh, fostering competition amongst nonprofits really doesn't help anybody. Uh, right when the nonprofits are really trying to meet emergent needs, whether it's through direct service or through long term systems uh, disruption and advocacy. Um, and so we want to foster that and we want to encourage collaboration. And then we also do a lot of work, and that's sort of where my um, expertise, I guess, or work lies in, which is funder education, which is recognizing that philanthropy as an institution, uh, while I guess in part started with good intentions, does have a lot of harmful 
practices and harmful side effects. Um, and some of these are unintended harm, and some of these are very much intended harm just by the nature of what philanthropy is. Um, and so we're recognizing that there is sort of an opportunity here to take what exists in philanthropy and until there are other ways that are more widely accepted and practiced, what can we do to, to make our existing institutions um, at least the slightest bit more equitable? How can we get it, get them to really um, fund in the interests of these nonprofits who are really trying to help communities that are um, you know, in need or meeting gaps that are not already being served by say government service or other opportunities or options? Um, and so that's sort of the broad strokes view of what I do. Um, and so I'm gonna hone in a little bit on this funder education piece a little bit. And, and the reason I say that is because the work that Liza's doing, you know, and, and the work that Yanni is a part of, right? And through Resist, like that is really, there needs to be more resources allotted to the work that Liza is doing and to the organizations that are part of Resource Organizing Project. And organization, organizations like Resist are doing a phenomenal job doing that. And I have no doubt that other funders supporting that work are also doing that in, in tandem with these organizations can only help these movements further along, right? Can only help to grow these movements and to grow these communities. And so, um, my work is really to talk to some of these funders in this area and, and talk to them like what is equitable resource allocation look like? What does trust-based philanthropy look like or uh, participatory funding practices? You know, what does it look like when you wanna fund advocacy and, and really focus on long-term change rather than immediate sort of direct service grants? Not that one is more important than the other, but you have to look at a systems level while also working on the ground. Um, and it's, we, we talked of a range of readiness in terms of where these funders come. Um, you know, there are funders who are like, oh, cool, thanks, you know, and then, you know, they dip out. And then there's funders who are like, oh, this is really cool. How can we take what you're telling us, like really broad information and narrow it down to apply to our funding practices? How can we make our applications for grants more uh, accessible or equitable? How can we reach more nonprofits? How can we build these relationships to give sustainably um, over a long term. So that's sort of what we're doing in funder education. Um, and what I'm really excited to talk about today is also a shift that we're recently making to, um, to incorporate more participatory practices into our work. Um, and so SIF has always tried to include participation in our work. Um, largely through, uh, we have what's called a social innovator accelerator. It's a whole lot of detail that I don't have time to get into today. Um, but in that process, when we're evaluating applications to join our innovator cohort, we do have um, evaluation sessions where we invite experts from the community to give input on, on sort of the work that's being done and, and each nonprofit that is applied to our uh, accelerator selection process tracks. Um, and so, while that's already there, we're recognizing also that as we're moving further along and as we're trying to make these shifts in a philanthropic sense, that people who are proximate to the work and not just like people who have worked closely with nonprofits in any like funding sense, but like people who are doing the work, people who are on the ground, who are at who are leaders for these nonprofits, who are leaders in their communities and who are talking to um, their community members and understanding like what do they really need like these are the people that need to be in the decision making roles and holding some of that power in terms of resource allocation in those rooms and so how can we better incorporate that into our structures um, and into our practices and I want to also sort of acknowledge that SIF as an intermediary um, and I guess in some ways as a convener we also hold a, a significant amount of power, right? Because we do have this process through which nonprofits are applying in essence to us, even if the funders are typically the ones making the decisions and they're going through this process to be selected to join an innovator cohort. There's eight selection tracks and only one can be selected on each track. And so there are elements where we're also learning and recognizing in partnership with our funders how can we be more equitable in some of these processes and how can we interject participation in really as many avenues as possible in order to make sure while we're also working on moving our system as a whole, 
making sure that elements are moving along with us and we're bringing along sort of not everything right shifts at the exact same time at the exact same pace and so what are ways that we can move some some things further along faster um while other things are catching up um and that's you know at sif and then also in the broader sort of systems change way um so that's sort of a broad strokes intro to my work and i'll pass it back to rebecca now Thank you all. You know me, I could talk about this all day, but I'm going to try to resist that myself. Um, but I'll just give you a couple of questions to start off. And then I'm, what I'm really hoping is that you just take the floor and have a conversation amongst the, the three of you. Um, but I am curious if you could let us know, um, first, where are you seeing the most energy, excitement, opportunity? This, what, where is the, your inspiration coming from that makes you know that you're on the right track? Who wants to take that one first? Liza, can I ask you? Yeah, I can start. Um, I think, I mean, movement sustainability comments, it's like there are so many different projects going on within um, the network that like I can't keep track of everything. And therefore I hear about new things happening and I'm like, this is incredible. Like everything that happens. Um, but I'll also, I think, um, you know, to Go back to a bit what you were saying, Aditi, about sort of how funders can be moving money, moving resources or responsibly towards groups. Um, I think that I'm seeing that like funders are really excited to support fundraisers in building um, in building more sustainability. Um, and there's some really fruitful partnerships there um, that ROP is, is you know, privileged to be able to help facilitate. Um, so I mentioned our sustainer learning circle. So the way that we provide, so basically when, when groups start the sustainer programs, their monthly donor programs, they're doing all that work themselves, um, but um, it's a huge capacity lift to um, basically run a big organizing campaign to get um, lots of your, your members to become monthly donors. And so the way that foundations are, are plugging in to support that is by helping provide the funding, helping provide matching funds for, um, for those campaigns. Um, and so it's kind of a win-win a situation where um, foundations are still collaborating um, and helping you know, give a boost to their grantees. Um, and then the, the grantees, the organizations are kind of using it as a jumping off point to create more sustainability. Um, so that's one example of a really like fruitful uh, collaboration. Thank you. Who's next on what your, where your inspiration and sense of, of hope and excitement is coming from? I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. Um, I think, so similarly, the first thing that came to mind was movement sustainability comments because it's just kind of blowing my mind every day. I think to offer something different, um, Resist is a part of a circle of funders um, called the, oh God, the Social Justice Funders Network, which uh, Social Innovation Forum does sit in. Um, and I've uh, been in the philanthropic space for about six years now, and I've been sitting um, in that circle for the past five. And I honestly wanna say the way that um, the pandemic has shifted how philanthropy is thinking about itself, is showing up in that space and how philanthropic uh, organizations are speaking to each other and holding each other accountable in a way that so many community groups have had to hold philanthropy accountable. Um, some of that has to do with just like new staff and like so many of us come from community-based organizations. But I also think there's a level of uh, reckoning that the philanthropic space is happening, is like having to uh, experience um, in a way that I haven't, I didn't expect to see, frankly, um, in the pandemic. I anticipated philanthropy to like isolate itself and go into a place of scarcity and what I'm seeing and hearing are colleagues pushing each other to move towards a space of abundance and trust that is critical to seeing any long-term change. Yeah, I see it too, it's exciting. 
Aditi. Um, thank you. I'm, I, I have to say, I'm really excited about Liza's work and Yanni's work. I think that is so exciting for me to hear more about. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to echo Yanni in, in saying that there is a lot of excitement in sort of the willingness to be a part of this movement, uh, particularly on the funder side, right? Like we know that the communities have been wanting to move for eons on all, all different kinds of issues, right? And we know that there have been institutions and systems and people in place that have been actively trying to stop that from happening, stop that movement, you know, and kind of disrupt it. And now the, the, the sort of tables are, are being turned, right? So now the disrupting is really what's at the front of the mind. And there are people who are wanting to fuel that disruption rather than stop it and find ways to do that in sustainable ways that are you know, long-term um, and have better end results. And that I think is so, so exciting. Um, and I'm also really excited by the challenges that we're sort of seeing in the best way from some of these nonprofits that are in our innovator cohort and in the Boston area and across the nation, honestly, because there is so much more focus now on collaboration and community liberation and community organizing um, and working together. And I'm, you know, I just yesterday attended an event where, with a couple of our innovators who were really kind of pushing the envelope a little bit and, and getting us at SIF to be like, oh, we've been doing this a certain way for a little while, but clearly there are other ways to be doing things and how can we explore to do that and tell and, and how can we work together um, to move that forward and so to be sort of in that space of like innovation for let me use that on purpose pun intended um, to be in that space for social innovation um, I think is just so thrilling to to be a part of that And where are the systemic challenges that you find yourself bumping up against the most, the most often that we're really going to have to all push together in the same direction on? Aditi, let's go in the opposite direction, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, gosh, where are the challenges? I mean, there are always right people who are just not ready to move yet. And I think that's, it's sometimes, it, it's easy sometimes to get bogged down in the oh my god but they're still doing harmful things or can you believe that she or, or they said that in this meeting or whatever uh in front of innovators in front of nonprofit uh leaders or you know there's always that sort of little bit in the back of your mind of like oh my god I'm not moving as many people as I want to or, or not as many folks are are joining our movement together uh as we would like to and that sometimes can be frustrating um and I think the other thing is also there are some sort of systemic assumptions uh that are in place that are are, are are we're having a hard time unraveling you know like some of these um nonprofits as a concept right is a not-for-profit which means it's not a business and yet philanthropy is institutionalized in this very business and investment focused mindset like that's where it was born and that's where it's living still um and so when you have people who are approaching this work um with this ROI focus, like, you know, how many, how, what is your impact? How many people are you serving? What is your budget? How many funders do you have? How much do you plan to scale in the next three years? You know, and there are some of those things that are, that are helpful to sort of, so that you can ensure the sustainability of your work as a nonprofit for your community. But a lot of that's really tough to sort of respond back to and be like, look, I served one person today, a meal that was their only meal in the day. And that's my success. And here I have these people who are investors um, at, at heart or in mind who are like, oh, well, how much are you gonna scale? How many more mouths can you feed? What are your numbers looking like and why are they not increasing? Um, so I think that's one challenge that we are certainly up against. Took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> um, you know, at Resist, we very intentionally don't do reporting and any time like when we send out uh, uh, acceptances of uh, uh, grants, the immediate response is like, okay, what reporting do you need? And when do you need it? And groups are always shocked and confused when I say, whenever you have anything you're celebrating, that's enough, just let us know, like what you are defining as success, right? And I think it's really disheartening to see how many, philanthropic organizations, despite all the internal transformation that I'm seeing and hearing, to then look at their grant application and see that nothing has changed. And that in particular, how, 
how philanthropy measures success is by a year to year cycle and has it internalized that systemic change cannot and will not happen in a two year, in a four year, in a five year. Like we can't put a timeline as to how the level of change that we're asking groups to make, like how long that's gonna take. So I really think like, Aditi, you were spot on on the like the business mindset that philanthropy has that that's another level of reckoning that we've yet to get to yet. Yeah. Liza, before you jump in, I, I want to just build on something that Yana, you just said, because you're not asking them to not be accountable. I think this is the challenge that people equate metrics and how many people per dollar are you serving? How, what, what are the returns you can show me on a quarterly or annual basis? The rejection of that is not a rejection of accountability. Accountability is being shifted to what success means in the lives of the community. And that's a jump that's really hard to make when you wanna monetize everything and, and you wanna count everything. Um, and I just, I just wanted to emphasize that I, I know you're not saying we're not accountable. Uh, it's just a different a different conceptualization completely of accountability. Liza, sorry sorry to to jump in there, but that's a that's one of my oh, pet peeves. <laughs> so important. Yeah, I mean to jump off the same theme. Uh, what's so discouraging is you know that the impact of these cycles is that um, you know nonprofit fundraisers and small movement organizations are stuck in like this hamster wheel of the grant cycle and therefore don't have the capacity to build. Um, any kind of sustainability outside of um, the uh, outside of, of the grant cycle. So it's like basically like every almost every small um, uh, grass, uh, organizing group that I talk to has the same basically approaches ROPs work, what we're offering in the same way, says, oh my God, I would love to have a monthly donor program. I would love to throw a collaborative fundraising event with my partners, but like, where am I gonna get the time to do that when I have all of these grant applications due? And, you know, that might be, and you know, the payoff from one grant application might be a hundred thousand dollars. That's gonna, you know, keep us going for another, um, another few months. Whereas like the payoff from really fundraising in community in a way that is like, um, you know, integrated with our organizing, the payoff is long-term, but it starts small and it's slow. Um, so it's really, it, it, it's just so intimidating and scary for nonprofit uh, fundraisers who might in theory, like want to um, align their, who, who are very much like wanting to align their fundraising with their values, but just feel like they can't do it. Thank you. Tether, Rebecca, you if you don't mind. Please don't go right ahead. I, something that you said, you know, I think it really speaks to um, the reality that like, as much as we want, to broaden the types of resources that we offer to nonprofits and to community organizers. Like a lot of this work at this time, like really can't be done without the money. And so to be faced with so many sort of barriers in, in getting that access and getting that financial stability to do our work, like that to me feels like the most, one of the most insidious parts of this altogether, right? Because they're kind of teasing you. They're like, oh, like, you know, jump through all of these hoops and sure, I'll give you like, you know, $500 or $2,500, which will fund, you know, like one day of programming or organizing. And that money comes with all of these different caveats and stuff like that. And so I think there's so much there in terms of not only philanthropic mindset, but culture as well, that we're trying to unravel of the culture of forced gratitude and the culture of reporting for the funder's sake rather than for, and, and risk management on the funder side. I think that's that's worth highlighting that like a lot of that reporting is so that funders feel like they're not making a big risk. And why is donating to nonprofits considered risky as compared to investing in the community? Like why, if we're gonna use investing language, like why isn't it that instead of, you know? So I think Liza, what you're saying, that's that's one thing that's like really resonating um, in that. How has your uh, approach to philanthropy um, impacted on and changed, if at all, the expectations of donors? I think it depends on the donor for, for at least in our network. <laughs> um, and I think I would say, um, I think I would say folks are trying 
it, you know, as to, to make shifts. And I think as, as Yanni also mentioned, like, you know, nonprofits who then are ready to give their reporting and are suddenly told they don't need to, like that's already ingrained even on the nonprofit side of things. That's a cultural shift that's changed that is yet to happen even on the ground. Um, and so it's hard to sort of break out of that cycle when it feels like a feedback loop where funders are like, oh, I'm not gonna ask for reporting, but then the nonprofit's like, well, do you want my reporting? Because they're expecting to have to give their reporting. And then the funder's like, okay, sure, like give me your reporting. And it doesn't really, um, and, and the way that Resist is doing things, you know, is far more in line with like, taking the burden off of the nonprofit's shoulders. And there are still funders who don't quite get that, who are like, oh, well, if you're gonna give it to me, yes, then give me everything rather than, you know. So I feel like there is desire and there is still a cyclical, a vicious cycle, I would say that it's difficult to sort of get out of. And I have two related questions. Um, how do you go about getting new organizations uh, that have not been part of the, uh, culture of philanthropy in front of uh, philanthropists who might not know about them. And um, secondly, I know that in the past, one of the uh, approaches that has been considered uh, to opening philanthropy uh, is to have mandatory sunsetting of funding to some groups so that funding can then be available to new groups and the sense of of uh, long-term dependence of particular groups uh, on the funding of, of uh, specific philanthropists can then be broken down. What, what's your view on, on sunsetting and how do you go about uh, uh, getting those new groups in front of uh, donors? And for folks who don't know who are watching, um, just a real quick primer here on the fact that many of these foundations are just holding on to massive endowments and are only required to give away 5% a year. So in the face of no matter how much need there is, that's all. And so that money just sits there. And so what Ted is talking about is saying, you can't sit on it forever. Get it out the door faster so that it's not a short list of your same old, same old organizations, but we're we're speeding things up here and bringing more people to the table. And so just, just so folks know where that question's coming from and what it's about, I'll leave it to you all to just say what you think about it. Yeah, and that 5% rule is basically set by the federal government and, and the Internal Revenue Service. It's not uh, uh, something that's going on local. It, it's, it's a national uh, um, ruling that says that you have to give some money away um uh, but that you shouldn't give a lot of it away all at once basically and i think the important piece just quickly about that five percent is that it's a minimum and that's the piece that for me is the most uh confusing because said to your point it's like we're not trying to necessarily say give it all away at once but that philanthropy in a broad sense is so focused on the like, oh, so we could only do 5% and uses the language of only is the like constant. And, you know, I uh, currently resist. We are not an endowed organization. We fundraise everything we give every year. Um, and so it's interesting to this question around the like, how do you approach donors, right? Because most of our donors are at a like, we have used a strategy that's very similar to what Liza and ROP are really working with community-based organizations. I want to say 75% of our donors give about 100 or less um, per gift, right? And so that there's a very small number um, of folks who have a lot of access to resources who are giving to resist. And we are constantly thinking about what does it look like to decenter resist as the philanthropic organization and introduce our donors to the organizations in their context, in their communities, and for them to give to those groups directly. Um, to your question around sunsetting, we at Resist, because we fund groups who are um, intentionally small or are looking to 
us to um, be incubators in some sense. We fund groups with budgets of 150,000 or less. We don't see that as an issue. And so have a multi-year grant with no limits as to how many times groups can uh, apply for it. But it's an interesting question to be considering. I'd love, I love your question around, um, you know, how we bring new groups in front of funders. And I think I'll say that the thing that on the, on the fundraiser end, the thing that scares us most from introducing um, other organizations to our funders is that we worry that our funders are going to be fickle and say, oh God, and, and, say, and say like, like, oh, we want to move on to the next hot thing, not fund you anymore because, you know, funders are very responsive to trends in many cases. Um, and so we have a really real fear that like, we don't want to talk about our friends doing other cool work. So what, what encourages us to, to want to introduce our partners um, is, and I'm not, I'm not saying we as ROP, but we as, you know, more like a, a, another, a more regular, like on the ground organization, like we need security um, and commitment from, um, from funders. Um, so that every year applying again and again, like it means there's that fear that like, um, there, there's that scarcity. Um, but when we can have like trust, like two way trust with a funder uh, who's saying, you know, what, what Yanni is saying of like, like, yeah, we love your work. You're gonna have ups and downs as an organization, but like, we're gonna keep funding you. And we wanna hear, um, you know, what else are you seeing in the ecosystem that you want us to know about that encourages us to, um, to say, here's another organization that you don't know about. Come look at, come, we think you'd like, you'd love to fund them in addition to us. Um, and so an example of that, like the celebration of grassroots organizing, the, the picnic that um, ROP helps organize, like, Every couple of years, like we add new groups, we add in new groups um, and the partner organizations are, I think when I first got involved, I was like, why would the partner organizations want to add in more partners? That means less money for them. Um, but because it's there's trust between them and an understanding that we're all growing together, there's a lot of excitement to say, I love this organization. I want to split my money with them um, and funders can help help uh, encourage that. I think this is also a really interesting thought in the um, intermediary landscape, so to speak, um, because what, like I said, what we do is relationship building. And so it is sort of building for us as the intermediary on the one side, we are building these, these relationships that are fostering trust with funders and getting to know funders on different levels and what, you know, what are they interested in funding and what sort of level of readiness are they at to engage in different maybe innovative funding practices um, or, or organizations that may not be sort of your mainstream, um, you know, cancer research organization or other such like mainstream nonprofits, right? And then on the other side, we're, we're meeting new nonprofits all the time and we're talking to them and we're getting to know their models. And then it's our responsibility to do something with that knowledge, so to speak, right? So building those connections and then knowing like who to introduce to who, because like Liza said, there is an element of risk on the nonprofit side to be introduced to a funder who's not interested in what they're doing or not able to fund them or wanting to fund them long-term um, or coming at them with a grant application that's really burdensome for them to take on, um, you know, at a time that they're not maybe ready to do that uh, capacity wise or, or otherwise. Um, so there is that element that we also have to mitigate. And it's such an interesting uh, power dynamic as an intermediary to have that in our hands, so to speak, and then to do with that sort of what we want to in a way that also then means that the relationship that we're facilitating can be sustainable without us too. That we don't wanna constantly have to be in the middle of that relationship, that we introduce a fantastic organization like uh, you know Sisters Unchained, which is an abolitionist organization um, you know, working uh, with uh, the daughters of people who are currently or formerly incarcerated and introducing them to funders who understand what abolition is and what does that look like on the ground and how can they better support that um, and making that connection and then immediately stepping out of it and being like, great, we love y'all individually, right? You guys can now talk and we will now step away um, and, and you know, be here when you need more, but um, allow that relationship to foster sort of without us as well. You know, the, the American economy and in fact, much of the world economy is, has really been booming over the last few years. Uh, stock prices and the value of people's wealth has gone up. 
And the incentive usually for giving money away is to reduce your tax liability on the one hand, and also to feel as though you're doing a good thing for people who uh, don't have the same kind of resources. And I'm wondering whether you're seeing um, any kinds of uh, new donors who are coming in because of the wealth um, that has been created uh, in recent years in uh, pharma or biotech. Um, and are there any correlations between uh, the people who are donors, actual or potential at this moment, and the people who are receiving the money, that is to say the beneficiaries? Who are the people who become donors and go into this field of philanthropy? And to what extent do they really know and understand what's going on, on in the communities that they're helping to support? And Liza, I know you need to jump off if you want to take a quick um, response to that or go ahead and get on to the next important thing you're doing this evening. Sure. Yeah. And I'm so sorry I can't stay later, but that's such a good question. And um, I think, yeah, I'd love, I don't, I can't speak too much to the particular like pharma and tech to like those sectors, but I, I would say that, um, you know, on the nonprofit side, like we're trying to really shift to think of donors and organizers as one and the same and really encourage um, encourage donors, whether at the $10 level or the 10,000 or 100,000 level to say like, don't just give us money, like be involved in our campaigns, like come to our events, get to know our people, volunteer, um, you know, host a house party with people you know, like that like just giving money is like giving money is just one way to engage. And then similarly, our members, you know, people who are active in the organizations and might not think of themselves as, as donors, but think of themselves as organizers to say, no, you can be donors too. So I think that um, and this also speaks, I think, to your, to your earlier question, Ted, of like, um, you know, how are donors shifting? I think merging the donor and activist labels, whether um, like, you know, across class, um, and across identities, I think is is one of the more promising ways of shifting things on the donor side. Yeah. Well, being respectful of everyone's time, I think I'd like to tie things up with that, Liza, because you have so beautifully captured what we mean by redistributing power. It's actually not about who controls the money so much as it, what is it we're trying to do collectively. And recognizing that this nonprofit sector is a place we have outsourced our most challenging and important problems without funding, with the hope that people are voluntarily going to give to it. And it kind of misses the point, which is that the, the money is just part of it, but so is the work and the relationships and the labor and coming together as co-equals in this space and recognizing that just having the money is, you know, it doesn't make you better than, smarter than, superior to, it makes you part of a relationship. Uh, and I see all of you working to build those relationships and, and just calling upon a complete reimagination of how the work works. So thank you so, so much. Uh, and we will look forward to hearing from you more um, in, in the future as this work continues. Ted, any last thoughts? Thank you all. You're transforming um, a, a process of transferring uh, wealth uh, from uh, those who feel as though they have generated it, whether or not they have, uh, to those who are clearly in need of uh, resources. And I think part of the conversation we've had tonight has uh, underlined that um, uh, when we think about wealth, we have to remember um, that not all of it is financial. Um, and that a lot of it uh, really comes from uh, how we look at the assets uh, that exist within communities that transcend money in and of itself. Um, we need to think in a much broader way of the uh, strengths and assets that exist within the communities that are uh, the beneficiary of these tax laws uh, that are set up to uh, transfer wealth. So I think it's been a great conversation and I think it opens for us uh, really a, a lot of uh, challenges uh, for how we think about addressing fundamental issues of uh, income inequality um, and uh, financial injustices that uh, uh, our economic system has uh, tended to perpetuate. 
So uh, let me give it back to you, uh, Rebecca, and uh, I want to thank our um, our presenters this evening. Yes, uh, my thanks to you all as well uh, for the inspiration and the labor. Um, also just want to mention to folks that next week we will be joining forces with our new Climate Justice Hub at Northeastern, which is also doing exciting work in the environmental justice space. We'll be starting a little bit earlier and having a panel that's going to be a little bit different than normal, but we think it's going to be really exciting. So we hope you'll come back for that. Have a great week, everybody, and thank you again.